Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are excited about today's presentation featuring Alex Mastin, Senior Director at Scenario. Alex will discuss how to secure your medical and IoT devices to reduce organizational risk relative to patient safety, data confidentiality, and device availability. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Scenario. Healthcare is Scenario's only business, and its mission is simple. Protect healthcare's weakest link to ensure patient safety, data confidentiality, and service availability. Their full suite healthcare IoT cybersecurity platform automates end-to-end -end continuous asset discovery for every connected medical, IoT device, and OT system in the clinical ecosystem. They view cybersecurity as a standard point of patient care and cover every threat vector with proactive and preemptive attack prevention tools. Automated risk reduction, threat mitigation, and step-by-step -step remediation programs built on the NIST Zero Trust Framework to get healthcare facilities secure fast. For more information, please visit Scenario.com. A few announcements before we get started. Please join us for continuing education, networking, and vendor engagement opportunities at our next HTM Mixer. We'll have several over the few months, next few months. We will be in Milwaukee on July 14th and 15th and in Kansas City on September 9th and 10th. Please visit htmmixer.com for details, registration, and our steps to a safe and clean meeting environment. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter so that you always have the most up-to-date information. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win a Webinar Wednesday shirt by answering the following question. In what city and state are Scenario's headquarters located? You can find the answer by visiting the our sponsor's website. Please use the question feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit your answer. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We'll wrap up today with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions at any time using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speaker today is Alex Mastin. Alex, you may begin whenever you are ready. Okay, excellent. Happy Wednesday and Cinco de Mayo to everyone. I appreciate you all joining us today on this web uh, webcast and, and webinar entitled Navigating the World of IOMT Security. Uh, we appreciate our partnership with Tech Nation uh, and, and the assistance that they've had to put this on and appreciate everyone's attendance uh, very much today. Real quickly going through our agenda as we go through this webinar. We'll do a quick introduction. I'll let you know who I am and my background. Uh, we, uh, customary to Scenarios webinars, we do like to launch uh, a few polls and surveys to you all to actively participate. Uh, this really helps us to understand who we're speaking with and making sure that we are tailoring the speaking engagement and webinar to the crowd. The last thing that we wanna do is insult the intelligence of people who have tuned in for this uh, webinar Wednesday, so we appreciate your uh, we appreciate your participation in that. Uh, then we're going to go into a little bit around what industry problem we are trying to solve relative to IOMT and IoT security, uh, and then I will spend a good amount of time on how to establish and best practices for establishing and implementing an IOMT cyber risk management program. Uh, as we go through that. And finally, uh, what are the success measurements of the program? Once we've established what that program is, how do we know that that program uh, has been fully successful? And I will uh, show you all some measurements on that as well. And we will end, as Jennifer mentioned, with a live Q&A session. Uh, as we go through this and as questions come out, please make sure that you are asking those in the questions area. Uh, and we will address those as they come in just to make sure that uh, 
your questions are being answered within the uh, timeline that we have in this presentation. Uh, so with that, just a quick introduction of who I am. As, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm Senior Director here at Cynerio. Uh, I do have about 11 years of healthcare compliance experience from uh, all three designations of a covered entity. I've worked in the provider side, the payer side, as well as the clearinghouse side. Uh, since I left uh, the hospital at Northwestern Memorial up in Chicago, where I was working, I've spent the last eight years uh, in information security, IT, and risk management. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm a former chief compliance officer and HIPAA security officer, so somewhat of a subject matter expert, although I use that term very loosely <laughs> as we go through that. Okay. So real quick, just to go through uh, who Cynario is, uh, as an organization, we are incredibly passionate about what we do uh, because this is our only business. We only service healthcare providers and healthcare organizations uh, in efforts to improve patient safety and the quality of care that they are giving to their uh, patient base. And we do that by safeguarding the devices that are critical to providing treatment uh, to millions of patients across the United States and around the world. Okay, I will not uh, go through this and belabor this for too long, uh, but just some industry recognition that we had received. I think it's, it's uh, not falling on deaf ears that 2020 was a very difficult year uh, with the pandemic, uh, and it was affecting almost every organization in our economy uh, in wholesale. However, as an organization, we uh, did achieve quite a bit of uh, industry recognition. We were named the Cool Vendor uh, by Gartner, which is something we're very proud of. Uh, we were named as the number one overall rated leader by Forrester, an independent research firm that actually looked at our platform. Uh, and one of the things that we're very proud about, especially as we went through the pandemic uh, and making sure that we were servicing our customers the best way possible, is we received uh, this award by the Network Products Guide uh, for the best technology to combat COVID-19. And as I go through this, this fundamental elements and building blocks of a program, I think it'll be relatively evident uh, why it's so important that our technology uh, was, was there for organizations, ensuring that the service availability of their devices and the ability to treat patients uh, remained at its highest uh, ability within these hospitals that we serve, okay? So as I mentioned before, we are going to go into a couple of polls and surveys, just helping us understand who is attending this webinar. Uh, and making sure that we are able to uh, able to service you and, and what you're listening to. And the first question that we would ask uh, is, what type of a healthcare organization do you represent? And we have a few options here that should be made available to you, uh, and you can select those as we go through. Uh, one is being an independent hospital. Uh, the other is a multiple hospital or IDN. The third is a vendor or services organization. Uh, or then if you're a provider or provider group, uh, that's great. And then please select other. And we appreciate you participating in these again. We want to make sure we're tailoring the webinar and conversation to who we're speaking with. Uh, and, and also important if, if for the CEUs that you're submitting, if there's ever an audit, we can go back and show evidence that you, in fact, participated in this uh, and, and, and weren't just uh, doing other things and multitasking while you listened along. So we'll generally do about 30 to 45 seconds keeping these polls open. Uh, so please uh, go through and select those. Uh, and looks like we have closed uh, the first one, I believe. And we will jump right over to the second question of our survey. And good, very helpful. I'm seeing exactly who we have on here. And it's a really, a really good spread that I think will lend itself to uh, a great presentation. So thank you. Uh, real quickly, let me get over to, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty. There we go. Our second survey question is, is how important is IOM security, IOMT security and risk management to your organization slash leadership? A top five priority is one answer. Somewhere in the top 10 priorities, not currently a priority, and I hope no one responds uh, to the last selection of what is IOMT. Uh, but please again respond to these and we can see how you're responding. So thank you. And also as, as you're going through this again, if you have questions about any of the content, please submit those through the question section within the GoToWebinar uh, application that's running.
All right, we'll do about 10, 15 more seconds. Beautiful. And looks like very good. Excellent. So the majority of folks who responded to this fall within uh, somewhere within the top 10 priorities or a top five priority, which is which is great, right? In our wheelhouse. So thank you. Uh, okay, let's get to the third and final question of the polls that we're going to go through. And the question is, currently, how confident are you in your organization's IOMT security and risk management program? Uh, first response or answer is completely confident and comfortable. The second one is solid program but needs work. Number three is not much of a program in place formally. Uh, the, the fourth is asked our vendor, uh, security vendor. And the last response is not really sure. So please respond to these. Again, this is really, really helpful information to make sure that the current webinar we're going through is, is tailored in a way that makes the most sense to you all. But also for future webinars, making sure that we have an understanding of who future participants may be and, and kind of the perspective that they give on this stuff. So thank you very much. All right, looks like we're closing out the poll. Thank you. Jennifer is doing a, a lovely job here. Excellent. So I'm just looking at the spread real quick. That's great. Awesome, awesome. So we're actually going to revisit this question uh, toward the end of the webinar after we've gone through you know, what a program looks like, at least from the perspective of Scenario and see kind of if any of the responses have changed uh, as we've gone through that. So it should be really, really cool to see how that goes. Very good, so let's just revisit our discussion flow. So the three areas that we're gonna go through now uh, is let's go over the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, then we'll go right into IOMT Cyber Risk Management Program basics and the pillars for how to build that program. Uh, and then we'll finally go into the last bit, which is program success and when you know your program is successful. Okay. So what exactly is the program or the problem that we're collectively trying to solve? Well, it's, it's really understanding uh, the risks associated to our connected devices. Now, at Cynaria, we really bucket uh, enterprise or what we call healthcare specific IoT into three buckets. Uh, and those are shown here. We have IOMT, which is Internet of Medical Things. And these would be things like uh, imaging equipment, patient monitors, IV pumps, really devices that are used for the direct patient treatment. Okay. The second bucket that we classify is what's called enterprise IoT. And these are things that everyone knows you have and everyone knows we have, uh, but may not have a really good inventory of these things. And these would be things like IP cameras, time clocks, printers, smart TVs, and so on and so forth. Okay. And the third bucket, and this is the one bucket that's often uh, missed in, in looking at the entire enterprise, is what's called OT or operational technology. And these would be things like building management systems, HVAC systems and their components, uh, elevator systems, all of those systems and a lot of their components are connected to your network and you may not really know it. But ironically, those devices oftentimes are carrying the same known vulnerabilities as that of the medical devices. So we really have to treat those from a risk management perspective as we go through this program, okay? But for today's focus, we're really going to look at IOMT uh, as a whole, especially as we start to build out this program and what is included within that, okay? So just some numbers and some trends that we have seen uh, since 2015 the number and the volume of devices and connected devices within hospitals and health systems is continuing to increase as there is a mission by all hospitals to improve the quality of care and efficiencies for which they're treating patients. Thus, the need for technology uh, continues to increase. And, and what we've seen is an increase from about 12 billion devices to uh, 26 billion devices from 2015 to 2020. And we expect for that to multiply by another three by 2025, upwards of 75 billion devices that are connected to the network, OK? 
Okay. Now, of all the connected devices that we see within an environment, one out of four, 25% of those connected devices are generally going to be uh, what we classify as IOMT. And of those devices, right around 40% of those are running unsupported operating systems, okay? And, and based on our uh, US hospitals poll that we did last year in 2020, right around 65% of hospitals have low confidence in their IOMT device visibility. And of course, compounding onto that uh, is the simple fact that the rise in cyber attacks is going to continue to go up. As more and more devices are introduced into the network, it is a bigger uh, threat landscape and thus attackers see that and are going to try to, uh, try to take advantage of the number and the volume of devices that are out there, okay? So because we just talked a little bit about the percentage of devices that are running unsupported operating system, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about ransomware, okay? Now, most of you all probably know what ransomware and how it works, uh, but just importantly, just in the last year, as you can see, there are four organizations and in, in hospitals and health systems across the world uh, that were heavily impacted by ransomware. UHS shut down 400 of their hospitals for three weeks, unable to bring in new patients and to treat patients effectively, had to triage them out uh, to other facilities because they weren't able to access the systems that had patient information. Uh, one of the first cases that led to an actual death of a patient was from Dusseldorf University over in Germany. Uh, where they were not actually able to bring in a new patient who was critical and in transit to the other facility that patient unfortunately passed away, okay? We've seen that there's over $157 million in damages from ransomware attacks. And now this number does not include uh, the number associated and dollar amounts associated to reportable breaches to the Office for Civil Rights. This is simply from downtime for a hospital and not being able to treat and bring in new patients, okay? Uh, we also know that about 90% of organizations have reported some kind of cyber attack. And as I mentioned before, just in Q3 alone of 2020, there was a 300% increase in cyber attacks, okay? Now, one of the most infamous uh, ransomwares uh, out there is Ryuk ransomware. And that is actually taking place of about one third or 33% of the cyber attacks from 2020 were in fact carried out by Ryuk. Okay, and that was the, the ransomware that was uh, known for the UHS attack as well as the Dusseldorf University Hospital attack, which I just covered. And the entry points that we saw uh, are generally going to be through some known vulnerabilities like eternal blue and eternal darkness, but also through phishing emails and people getting emails where they click on hyperlinks and that gains access into and onto devices within the network, as well as TrickBot and Emotet, okay? Now, why this is such an important and such an affecting uh, ransomware in Ryuk is that within five hours, Ryuk can infect every single device within that network, okay? And generally the devices that we have seen that have been most affected by Ryuk and easiest to, to infiltrate are VoIP phones, radiology devices, lab systems, and EKGs. And, and all of those things fall within this ecosystem of healthcare-specific IoT, okay? So we like to show a little bit of a diagram of what ransomware looks like if it were to infiltrate a flat network where there's no segmentation. And so you can see on the far right, there was a device that was infected by Ryuk and ransomware, and quickly it moves across to other devices that are on that same uh, VLAN or that same network, okay? And that's the danger of ransomware. All of a sudden, the access and availability of the devices that are infected uh, completely go away. And so the thing that you have to do and what's normal for organizations, and, and most all of you are probably working through this now, are figuring out ways to segment devices to ensure that the threat landscape and that vertical, or excuse me, horizontal movement by ransomware is limited in that impact. Uh, and that's exactly what the challenges are that we see uh, with organizations who are trying to, to create segmentation policies. Number one, there's a lack of visibilities. You don't know what you, you don't know what you don't know that's on your network. Uh, there's always going to be the possibility of fear of service disruption. So even if you know what devices you have and you know how to segment them, 
making sure that all the connection and communication patterns are, are visible and are, are very clear so that those devices maintain the operating effectiveness. Uh, and then the manpower to actually push these policies and get those policies actually uh, enforced out to the firewall or your network access controller. All of those are challenges. And so the, the necessary steps in actually segmenting are in really four categories. Mapping, which is identifying the devices that are on your network, uh, understanding the communication patterns and how they're connected to each other. And then you have to take time to actually validate to make sure that you have every possible communication to fit into that minimum necessary category of how that device needs to communicate to work. And then optimization is making sure that you've gone through the process of ensuring that policy is ready to go and actually deploying and pushing that policy out to your firewall or your NAC is that final step called deployment, okay? Now we bring into the fold a different type of concept called virtual segmentation, okay? And this is where our solution, and I will get into this in pretty decent detail, is going to actually automate the policies that we create based on the communications that we see. We test that policy to ensure that it is safe and would not bring down any devices and the operating effectiveness. But then we also give you the ability to tweak those policy whitelisting communications. Uh, and this can be done within weeks. And we've heard from many of our customers that these segmentation uh, policy creation and projects are taking upwards of years to actually create test and push out. And so we can really increase that timeline for organizations, okay? So I wanna show another simulation similar to what I showed before, but this is if we are actually to segment the, the, the network to have medical devices away from general IT assets like laptops and desktops, okay? Because as I mentioned before, a lot of times Ryuk is going to infiltrate via phishing campaign where someone, an employee is clicking on a link that they don't know uh, and, and the devices that are on that VLAN or that network can be affected. But as you can see here, the ransomware infected one device, but because we've segmented our medical devices off onto different segments, that ransomware can no longer move outside of that segment that was affected. So that's really where from a risk perspective, we're able to reduce the threat landscape and thus reduce both the likelihood uh, of ransomware attacking the whole uh, organization, but also the impact to the organization if it were to actually occur, okay? So flowing this all together, uh, there are some inherent challenges that we see uh, from an industry problem that we summarize that there are hundreds and thousands of IOMT devices that have significant risk. Really what it comes down to is this is a volume game for organizations. There's so many devices on the network they don't know what they have necessarily running uh, and especially don't know all the details about those devices. The second piece of what we summarize is that there have been such an increase of cyber attacks that directly impact IOMT devices because of the legacy or out of support operating systems. And so we have devices that are carrying vulnerabilities that could lead to ransomware or other cyber attacks that we know of, okay? And summarizing the industry challenges that we see, lack of IOMT visibility, not knowing what we have, resource limitation from both a personnel perspective and budgetary, lack of expertise, so understanding the information, what's necessary for these devices to function appropriately, uh, knowing all of the different threats and vulnerabilities, and then also lack of technology, being able to quickly identify these devices and actually doing something about the risks that are identified, okay? So here is a, a moment where we'll actually go right back into our discussion flow. And we've talked about what problem we're trying to solve. Again, it's all about understanding what you have on your environment, understanding the risks associated and being able to do something about that, okay? So the second piece of this is let's actually talk about what a cyber risk management program looks like for IOMT, okay? And there are going to be three buckets of, of, of kind of what this, this program looks like. And, and I use the term program relatively loosely, but the first bucket is going to be what we call framing and governance, okay? Within framing and governance, you have program uh, ownership and oversight, who actually is owning this program. And even though you have one department that may be owning this, it really takes a village. And I'll explain what that means as we go through uh, this program. Understanding within that program ownership and who's responsible, the roles and responsibilities of the personnel within, 
And then when we start talking about risk management, framing and governance is going to be extremely important to understand how we define risk as an organization. And we may need to adopt the risk management program or the risk management components from the overall organization and try to apply that to IOMT specifically. But understanding what that risk management framework is and what is our risk tolerance as an organization? How are we going to know whether we can accept risk or we'd have to do something about that risk? Finally, it wouldn't be a program without policies and procedures, uh, really the backbone to any program, making sure that everything about that program, roles and responsibilities, the framing and governance is all documented as a method for which we are following consistently. And, and finally, program enforcement, measuring ourselves against the effectiveness of our program based on what is documented in policies and procedures. All that is extremely important. And that's really that first pillar of this program, okay? The second pillar of the program is going to be personnel and expertise, okay? So some organizations we work with uh, have full-time employees who are dedicated to this effort and to this program. But then other customers we have are actually outsourcing the cybersecurity piece to their IOMT. Now, one of the things that's often overlooked is the concept of thought leadership, okay? Just because you throw bodies at a program is not going to be the solution that you necessarily want. It takes a lot of knowledge and expertise in order for the program to be effective and efficient. Uh, and to progress this program that's to, to a point where it's scalable for your organization, okay? And finally, uh, and of course, selfishly being from Cynario, we would say that tools and technology is as important as the others, uh, but having a connected IOMT security platform that is going to be inclusive of other technology tools that you may already have as an organization, like your CMMS, your ticketing systems, your network uh, tools that you already have purchased, uh, that's going to be vital to making this program effective uh, to actually work and round out the entire program, okay? So let's drill in, excuse me, let's drill into the framing and governance based on those buckets. And let's talk a little bit about program ownership. So regardless of who and what department is going to own this program, it's extremely important that you take a committee approach for managing IOMT security and the risk management associated to that. And I'll give you an example. And I'll go into this in more detail as we get into the risk assessment portion. But for organizations, what we generally see in customer deployments is that Biomed tries to take the handle of this program and own this program. When we start getting into the risks and vulnerabilities associated to IOMT devices, because these devices are running old and legacy operating systems, what we generally see is that only about 20% of the risk mitigation activities and re recommendations that we make can actually be done by Biomed. Because a lot of what we see is that in order to reduce the risk and reduce that threat landscape by segmentation, you're going to have to pull in security and networking in order for that to work most efficiently and effectively, okay? And so roles and responsibilities within that program ownership again and within that committee approach, you may see folks from biomed and clinical engineering, obviously, the IT team, security team, networking team, the risk management team, and oftentimes even procurement. And people always ask me, why would you include procurement uh, into this process? And it's really for two reasons. Number one, when you're talking about devices that are on the network, a lot of times procurement uh, with, in conjunction with IT is going to be responsible for vetting any new devices that come onto your network. And so the collection of the medical device security standards with MDS2 forms may fall into the requirements of what procurement has to do. So having those readily available as new devices are coming in is vital to ensuring you understand the security capabilities of the devices that are coming onto your network, okay? From a framing and risk management uh, and a governance perspective, as I mentioned before, what's really important is to understand how you as an organization are going to define risk. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned at the beginning of the introduction, uh, we have adopted the NIST framework uh, for both zero trust and or for, uh, risk management and risk assessment framework. So the special publications 30 and 39. 
Uh, and then what do we do about the risk? Meaning, do we know when we're going to automatically accept certain risk based, based on the risk tolerance or risk threshold versus risks that we'll actually have to do something about or respond to in a manner that is mitigate or transfer or potentially remediate, okay? Finally, as I mentioned before, this is a very important concept to any program is the documented policies and procedures that govern and create scalable ways of, of, of performance against that program. Uh, also, as, as we all know, turnover is, is bound to happen and making sure that there are documented policies and procedures that show how these programs are going to be run is, is vital for the scalability of that program, okay? And finally, program enforcement, and this may be something that uh, you guys don't ever wanna hear, uh, but a lot of our customers actually lean on internal audit to do some internal auditing against the effectiveness and the operating effectiveness of the program itself. So bringing internal audit in, saying here's the framework for our program, here's what we're doing, uh, please come in and, and check us against that to ensure that our program is, is operating effectively. And this can be a great way to bring in leadership uh, buy-in to the program is, is having them understand that there will be an internal audit against our program, and those findings will be uh, reported directly up to CIO, CEO, CFO for the operating effectiveness of that program, okay? So real quickly, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, talk about the personnel and expertise side of things. So again, some of our customers have internal staff, and what we're starting to see more and more often is an actual FTE that is somewhat of a liaison or intermediate between the biomedic clinical engineering folks and the IT and security folks. And the reason why that's important is because this person is going to have industry knowledge on both the IT and security side, but also knows a lot about biomedical equipment and, and clinical engineering equipment. And that, that creates a really good mold between those two departments. Other organizations that we work with, as I mentioned, are going to outsource to a service provider like a Sodexo, a Trimedics, a GE, whomever you're contracted with. So I will say this, if, if you're an organization who outsources a lot of your biomedical uh, maintenance and support to a managed service provider, make sure that you're asking them about the effectiveness of the cybersecurity piece and making sure that they're involved in that because they're the ones who know the most about the devices that are within your network and within your organization, okay? And then finally, thought leadership. And this goes, just, this goes beyond just the understanding of the uh, IT security side, cybersecurity side, and the biomed side, but also understanding uh, how this is such an evolving threat landscape. Again, we're bringing more and more devices into the network uh, that are, are really opening up a lot of threat vectors to the organization. Uh, and, and this could really result in possible patient safety issues, but also quality of care and service disruption. So understanding how those threat landscapes are changing is going to be so vital for your thought leadership and the people who are a part uh, of this program, okay? And finally, tools and technology. Uh, this is our, our sweet spot as an organization. Uh, but most organizations who have a holistic program, uh, like what I'm talking about, have this IOMT security platform, okay? And this platform is, is a great platform because it's going to help you identify all your devices. It's going to do risk assessment of all your devices. But most importantly, what's specific to Scenario is that we are going to give you every mitigation recommendation for every vulnerability and risk that is present and, and out there on your network, okay? Now, the importance of these integrations that you see here in making sure that we're able to integrate with the investments that your organization has already made is for data enrichment, but also for translation to IOMT. Many of the solutions that you are seeing here that you've purchased are really only relevant right now to IT assets and traditional endpoints. Well, through integrations with our platform, we can enrich the data uh, on both sides, but also we can start to translate some of the use cases for these solutions over into the IOMT space for you, okay? And there's a lot to unpack with that. That was a, a very high level way of saying that, but that's, that's essentially what we do in integration, okay? So let's get into a little bit of how our platform works. And what I will do is I'm actually going to take us through an IOMT risk assessment and risk management activity and strategy 
uh, showing some screenshots from our platform. Um, but the way that our platform works is we are a passive solution. So we're actually going to connect to your span or your tap, and we're going to do a port mirror of the traffic that you're seeing across your organization. And sometimes there has to be multiple appliances that are installed uh, to get that traffic. But ideally, we're looking for the most optimal east-west and north-south traffic to ensure that we're able to identify all of the devices. Okay, and, and that traffic and the metadata from that traffic, we don't look at any EPHI, none of the EPHI leaves your environment, but we take metadata up into our cloud environment at AWS where we do our analysis and deep packet inspection of the traffic that we see looking specifically for healthcare protocols, HL7, DICOM, and the 30 plus other uh, healthcare specific protocols. And we're going to then automatically inventory all of your devices. And for every device that we find and see via traffic, we're actually identifying over a hundred different data points for that device that are inventoried uh, in our solution. And as I mentioned over here with the integrations, with a lot of the solutions that your organization has probably already purchased uh, for IT assets, we integrate with those to make this a holistic platform for IOMT cybersecurity, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the risk assessment and risk management of IOMT devices. And, and this will take about five minutes and I'm actually going to take a use case. And so the value of using our platform for the risk assessment or risk analysis is twofold. Number one, it helps you to identify what risks you have relevant, relevant to every device, but also adheres to the requirements from the Office for Civil Rights in performing that HIPAA security risk analysis at 45 CFR 164-308-A12A. And by doing that, what you're able to actually show is that you've looked at every device that is used to create, receive, maintain, and or transmit EPHI. And we can take that information and push that forward into our overall risk management strategy, okay? So whenever you're doing a risk assessment in alignment with OCR's final guidance, the first thing that you would want to do is you would want to ensure that you're showing and, and have an idea of how you're defining risk and what that risk uh, tolerances for your organization. And a lot of times what organizations do uh, is they're going to, from a risk tolerance perspective, they're actually going to take and draw a line in the sand between, as you can see here in the middle, the critical risks, the high risks, the medium risks, and the low risks. And they'll draw that line in the sand between medium risks and high risks and say, we have so many devices, so many risks. Let's really just focus on the critical and high for now. And we may be able to work our way back to the medium risks that are still posing a threat to our organization. As I mentioned before, uh, as an organization, we've adopted NIST. So you're going to see instances of likelihood times impact of how we calculate risk. Um, but most organizations, when we're outside of the medical devices, are going to look at impact based on uh, confidentiality, uh, integrity, and the availability, or the CIA triad. Well, we take that a little bit further specific to healthcare where we're looking at patient safety, patient confident, confidentiality, and service disruption, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into this as well. So once you have your framing and governance, you've set that aside, you know exactly how you're defining risk and you know exactly what your risk tolerance is, the next step in our process is you have to then identify all IOMT. If you're going to do a risk assessment that's comprehensive, you first must know what you have, okay? And in our platform and through the automation of identification of devices in those 100 plus data points, we give a lot of different views on inventory. As you can see in this screenshot, we can tell you the number of devices based on specific vendor and the risk associated to those vendors. But then we can also show you the number of devices based on type of device. So really cool views to help prioritize, but also for people within your organization to focus in on where their responsibilities may lie. Okay. Once you've identified all of those devices, then we're going to actually do a risk assessment of those devices. Okay, and you need to understand the risk at both the individual device level, but also at the fleet level. And that's really important as well. We give you this view. As you can see here, we're seeing the security posture across all of the uh, devices. We're looking at infusion pumps for this, uh, or IV pumps for this exact example. But then we also show you all the different risks and vulnerabilities and findings that we see here for this entire fleet of devices. 
And then we break down the assets impact and risk based on, again, confidentiality, patient safety, and service disruption. Okay. And this is really important. Again, this confidentiality, patient safety, and service disruption is only relevant to the healthcare industry and, and providers specifically. Okay. Excellent. So the second piece of that is once you've done the risk assessment, you also need to know your risk. You need to understand all of the events and vulnerabilities associated to those devices. And so we categorize this in three different buckets. We have our recalls, which some of the recalls are going to come from FDA, the Food, Drug and, Food and Drug Administration. But then some of the, the uh, recalls are going to actually be vendor voluntary based on what they know about their own devices. Okay, and we are going to identify all those for you and associate those to each individual device. The second bucket of, of events or, or risks that we find are going to be behavioral risks because we are listening to the traffic on your network and identifying devices through deep packet inspection, we're seeing how these devices are communicating and thus we're able to actually identify risks associated to those communications. Open ports, vendors using weak credentials or shared passwords or weak passwords to get into the devices for maintenance, uh, devices that have unrestricted internet access that are accessing social media sites like TikTok and YouTube and Facebook. Uh, all of those types of communication patterns we are seeing as we go through the process of inventorying and are categorizing these risks for you as an organization. And finally, the third uh, events that we are going to tag for you are going to be the known vulnerabilities. And these are going to be things like Amnesia 33, Ripple 20, Urgent 11, and most uh, recently a new vulnerability called Name Rec. All of those vulnerabilities, again, are associated directly to the device, and a lot of that has to do with the operating systems uh, that are being run on those devices. So this is just a quick view of, of the dashboard for a specific device where you're seeing uh, all the general information about the device, the make, model, manufacturer, when it was first seen on your network, when it was last seen on your network, the severity score of that device, uh, network information, IP address, MAC address, um, the VLAN, and then finally, IT information. Does it have endpoint security? Is it part of your Active Directory? Uh, what is the operating system that's being run on that device? And a lot of that information gives us the insight into those three categories of risks that we identify, as you can see in the top right corner. SAC slowness, the CVE 2020-25-165, Urgent 11, and then those two FDA recalls associated to this PCU 8015, okay? So once you know your risk, you then must be able to effectively respond to that risk. And so because we're a true risk management platform, we give you the ability to respond to that risk appropriately. And so when we're in the risks tab here, all the different risks that are identified in events, the vulnerabilities, the recalls, and the behavioral risks, and up in that top right corner, you see where it says active and we give you the ability to respond to that risk by selecting active, mitigated, or accepted once you've gone through the process of handling this risk, okay? And taking this into an actual action plan, we are going to group all of the, uh, all of the risks and vulnerabilities into the recommendations that we make. So as you can see here for these PCU 8015 pumps, uh, we suggest that you apply an east-west segmentation, but also change configuration uh, for that SAC slowness vulnerability. And through our solution, you can actually create and automate the, the segmentation policies. Now, this is another example where we identified a 9.8 severity score or a risk score for this Alaris PCU pump. And we know that there are probably going to be a lot of these devices in your environment. Well, there's no patch available. So this falls within that 80% of devices that you have to bring in the networking and security team in order to reduce the risk uh, to that device, okay? So as I mentioned before, we are going to automatically create the segmentation policy for east-west uh, communication. By clicking on create policy, it's automatically going to take the one device that we're looking at and through machine learning and artificial intelligence, pull in a uh, policy that includes not just the one device, but as you can see here, 462 PCU 8015 pumps into this policy. Now, the way that we're configured is that you're actually going to be able to use our what we call our validation engine, 
to validate the information of the policy, making sure that the devices are communicating with the minimum necessary uh, to keep that pump running. And then once that policy has been tested and validated through our integration with your network access controller, whether you have Cisco ICE, whether you have ClearPass or Forescout or whomever else, we will integrate directly to where we can automatically push this policy and the ACLs out to that NAC or your firewall, okay? From a low-hanging fruit perspective, what we've done is we've created a risk mitigation activity that is going to reduce the 462 devices that have a critical risk down to a manageable or within our risk uh, threshold. And that's really the name of the game. That's what we're trying to accomplish through this program, okay? So we've, we've kind of seen that life cycle of what is included in the program, including the technology. We know what problem we're trying to solve. So how do we know when we have a successful program? Well, it really comes down to understanding and making sure that the organization with leadership buy-in has the right people involved in the program with governance, personnel, tools, and technology based on how your policies and procedures are governing this overall program, okay? The second piece to that is in excuse me, ensuring that all IOMT devices have been identified that are on your network, they've been risk analyzed, and the devices that have risks that fall above your risk threshold are responded to within a reasonable amount of time, okay? Ultimately, you just have to ensure that everyone who is on the train are in the correct seats in order to have a successful program. So validating the why and kind of what we're doing here with this program, and especially the use of our technology, is no matter how many critical and high severity devices and risks and vulnerabilities you may have, by utilizing a technology like Scenario, that is going to lead you to having a 100% reduction, excuse me, you're going to be able to reduce 100% of those high and critical risks down to a level that is below your risk threshold or within your organization's appetite to accept that risk. Okay, because we're giving you the tools to be able to reduce that risk. You're not guessing at how to do that, okay? So at this point, what I like to do to finalize my presentation is actually go back to the question, uh, poll question number three, where we're actually going to see, now that you've listened to this webinar and you have an understanding of how we define what a program looks like, how confident now are you in your organization's IOMT security and risk management program? And again, always appreciate the participation in these surveys and polls. So thank you very much for answering these. Awesome, awesome. About 10 more seconds and we can close the poll. All right, excellent. So as uh, the poll is shared with me so I can kind of see the spread and how we all responded. Excellent, excellent. So some shift from completely confident down to solid program but needs work. So that's great. I think, uh, I think we've done a lot of uh, information here. So what we'll do now is we will actually go into the active Q&A section where I'll answer your questions, but let me just uh, say that I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you for listening to, to our webinar. Uh, if you need more information, please contact me directly. I always love when people connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, social media rules all uh, these days. Um, please connect with me, uh, contact me with any questions. If you wanna see a, a detailed demonstration of our platform or need any additional information, uh, please uh, let me know, and our website is right there. There's a lot of really good white papers and content for education purposes uh, on our website. Uh, but thank you all very much, and we will open the floor for questions now. Thank you so much, Alex, for all of this valuable information. As a reminder to our audience, if you do have a question for our presenter, please use the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We do have a few questions that have come in already, and we'll start with those. 
Our first question is, how are the MDS2 forms used exactly? Yeah, good question. Uh, so that's a, a question that we, we commonly get actually, and, and there's a, a few different ways that the MDS2 forms can be used. Uh, for the most part, it's kind of checking the box of understanding the security capabilities uh, of the devices that are coming onto your network. Um, but that information is similar to what you may see in a vendor security questionnaire that goes out to a services provider vendor uh, or a vendor who's going to be uh, doing some kind of a SaaS tool for your organization. Uh, the MDS2 form is, is kind of that level of assurance that helps you understand the security capabilities. So organizations will collect those as a part of their procurement and their IT security uh, due diligence process for bringing on new devices. Now, a lot of the information in there is really just used, again, to understand the security capabilities, but there's some good nugget of information in the MDS2 that can inform you of, of what you as an organization can do to secure those devices. So one of those examples is some devices will allow you to install your own antivirus software on there. And if that's the case, then, then you would need to check with the vendor to make sure that the antivirus uh, software that you as an organization have subscribed to uh, can actually install that and they're okay with that. Um, but that's just one way of using it. The way that we use it in our platform is we digitize the information for two reasons. Number one, it's easier to digest the information if the, if the data is digitized, you can search for things. Uh, but we also do what's called cross-referencing. This is a unique uh, this is a unique solution that, that we have to where you can actually look and see what other devices have similar security capabilities to whatever MDS2 you're looking at. Uh, so an example that I just gave, if you want to see really quickly all devices within your network to where you can install antivirus software uh, on your own, you can do a quick look and search by that. Okay, so that's really important stuff. Great, our next question is, what information on the dashboards is most useful? Sure, sure. So that's a it's somewhat of a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> probably, and, and I would assume when you say dashboards, we're, we're talking literal dashboards that would be in the platform, but it depends on, on who the information is going to. If you're in an executive leadership position, you're really wanting to see progress in dashboards. You're wanting to see what are what all risks do we have? What are we doing about those risks? And where are we going to be in the future? It's kind of that future state of making sure that we're not negligent on responding to risks and actually doing something about that. Um, if you're in the biomed and clinical engineering side, then the dashboards are going to be really important for uh, understanding uh, devices and the communications of devices, but also any new recalls in FDA, uh, from the FDA that come in for maintenance purposes. Um, so there are a lot of different use cases. It's a very, it's a difficult question to just pinpoint one response, but uh, all of our dashboards are custom configurable to where you can add in widgets that are relevant to whatever you're trying to report on uh, and so on and so forth. And I'd be happy to give more information if needed. Our next question is, how long does implementing this kind of solution take? And what does implementation look like in practical terms? Yeah, the, the, I like the last piece of that uh, in practical terms. So, so in, a perfect, in a perfect environment and implementation, uh, we always get information ahead of time to pre-configure uh, pre servers or appliances before we send them to the customer. To where it's really supposed to be you pull it out of the box and you, you plug it into and rack the server and and you're good to go it should be that simple um, and generally it is for most of our, our customers implementation uh, for our full solution from going from having uh, not a server connected to a server connected to having a full inventory and a risk management uh, action plan can take anywhere from three to five days and and for a larger health system where there are multiple appliances going in, uh, can take somewhere around the two to three weeks uh, time, frame, time frame as well. Great, our next question is, you talked about resource limitations as one of the biggest industry challenges, especially with COVID, we're limited on personnel, budget, and actual equipment. 
Yep. Does this kind of product also help with inventory and device tracking? Absolutely. So that's the whole purpose of the platform is to have a holistic inventory of connected devices. Now, for the, the devices that are non-connected or, or dumb devices that are just it's equipment, uh, if you already have a CMMS for that, we integrate with your CMMS so that we're pouring our information into your CMMS. And a lot of times it's actually going to be beneficial more on the CMMS side than our side because we're actually seeing live traffic and we're, we're looking at traffic constantly. So it's in real time, whereas a lot of CMMS information is going to be uh, is going to be static. Uh, ours is dynamic. So to answer your question, uh, full inventory is done through our platform. Uh, you can monitor devices for a few different things. Number one, new devices that come on the network, we would give you events on what those are. Uh, also, if there are any new vulnerabilities or new risks associated to that device, we're giving you that information in real time. And then finally, from uh, from a an actual IDS or intrusion detection perspective, we actually uh, have a feature to allow you to monitor uh, traffic that's inbound and outbound looking for malicious behaviors and, and looking at the forensics of that communication. So I hope I answered your question, but uh, a lot of these questions that are coming in are, I could talk on these for <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes easily, but I wanna make sure we get through all of the questions. Our next question is, I did not hear you cover any antivirus updates on medical equipment. How important is that? Sure, uh, it's it's very it's very important. Um, and again, whether whether you as an organization are managing uh, the maintenance of in, ensuring that the antivirus is updated, uh, or it's the vendor uh, making sure that this should be a part of the routine maintenance that's going on. Um, when it comes to to antivirus software, where we have checks and balances, especially from the MDS2 form, is we not only will we tell you the devices where you can install your own antivirus software. Uh, but also we can give you insight into devices that are or are not running some kind of endpoint security. So we can validate whether or not the AV is installed and running and operating effectively on those devices. Um, but as far as the actual maintenance of making sure the antivirus is, is updated um, through integration, we can we can tell you the the level of or the uh, the which whatever. Um, excuse me, whatever level the antivirus is or the, the can't think of the word, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, so anyway, we will help you understand what the, the antivirus patch level is, if that makes sense. Thank you so much, Alex, for your time today and for a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone to visit our sponsor uh, to learn more about the products and the services that they provide to our industry. Please visit Cinerio.com. A quick reminder, you can obtain your continuing education certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI. You'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once you submit the survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back soon with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and for complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.